Well, let's now continue, if you will, with, we've just said a few words about volume three, much more could be said about it, but you can see already that in volume three, just as in the first and in the second volume, the same approach is, that is, God is his revelation, and he is fully revealed, and he is fully hidden, therefore you must never have the orthodox view of that Sophon as gift, and God is Jesus Christ is the real man. He's the only man. The only man. That is to say, he is the only real man. Now, you see, the whole thing is passed into metaphysics again. Participation in manhood. It's exactly the same sort of thing that you find in Greek philosophy, notably in Plato, that man is what he is because he participates in deity. Well, here you have the notion of participation through Christ in deity. The Christological emphasis is here, but it is Greek, nonetheless, Greek thinking in effect. Now, this fourth volume is particularly important because it deals with the question of the death and the resurrection of Christ as the basis of man's salvation and with it, of course, also of man's faith in believing this salvation. Now, what is salvation? Incidentally, when he started at this volume, then I thought he was getting tired. And then <laughs> when you had three, and you had three, one, and it was only 600 or so pages, and I thought, well, a little thin book like that. And I thought, well, I'm glad Bart's getting tired. He can write faster than I can read. <laughs> and I thought, after this, we'll have just like that. But then, and that was Esther Kyle, of course. Esther Kyle. Weiser Kyle. And then came Schrether Kyle and Schrether Kyle. Four, four books. Three volumes. And that's what he's been continuing only in this fourth one. He has iron, clay, dry, here. And then he divides up three into two parts again because he said that people couldn't lift the second one, <laughs> second part of the second volume. And it is that way. Mine is all fallen to pieces because it's obviously impractical to have a book of 11 or so hundred pages. One binder just can't hold it. And if you use it a lot, it falls to pieces. And so in concession to me, I take it. Uh, he cut this up. And now, the big point is this, of course, what is salvation? It is not, of course, that there are people who, who have been elect in Christ from all eternity, who are now to be saved in history by the work of the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ in, in history. In order to understand what is what he means by salvation, we have to particularly understand what he means by Geschichte and what he means by his story. Now, this distinction comes from the Kantian notion of I it, which is ordinary history. This is the field of science, and this is where Jesus of Nazareth lived. And here's where the events that are spoken of in the Bible, events in the ordinary sense of the term, space-time events, calendar events, events that you can date. You can speak of a death that takes place on one day and of a resurrection of that same Jesus that takes place on the third day afterwards. But the big point to remember is that for Bart, revelation is history, but history is not revelation. Though God is wholly revealed here, he is always wholly hidden here, and therefore you can never, never, never do what the Orthodox have always, always, always done and are guilty of doing, namely to identify the death and the resurrection of Jesus with an event that takes place on the calendar. I was once attending a Presbyterian church in Willowbro, Pennsylvania. There was a young minister there, son of a, in law of a Christian reform minister. And the first thing he said was this, some people divide things by the calendar, others divide them by the Christ. Now, which one do you want to be with? 
of course, with the Christ, don't you? Well, then you must get away from the calendar. That is to say, you must not be so orthodox as to say on a certain calendar day, on Good Friday, Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, was laid in the tomb, and, and that on a certain, on a third day, he rose from the dead. You must not say that this is the resurrection. Now, you must say that God is Christ, and Christ is the revelation of God, and he is identical with his work. Now, we saw that Christ is the electing God, and Christ is the elected man, so that Christ is, when you talk about the person of Christ, and you talk about the natures of Christ, the divine and the human natures, the way Chalcedon does, then you must actualize Chalcedon, as he says he has done, and he says he's sorry that he has to depart still further from Calvin at this point than he has done in earlier volumes. He says we must say that God did turn into the opposite of himself, and that when he has wholly lost himself in sure contingency, then he takes mankind up again into participation, into the very aseity, the very heart center of God. Now that is God's nature in Christ. That's become down dialectically into the other, holy other of himself. Now you can see how similar that is to, to Hegel's dialecticism. God realizes himself through history, through the concrete events of space and time, enriches himself and returns unto himself enriched. Now, this is, therefore, I would say, a submergence of the Christian religion in this modern existentialized form of pagan philosophy. Now, applied to the death and the resurrection of Christ, that means, therefore, that you can certainly speak of a man named Jesus as having died. That, you can say, happened on a calendar day. And you must even say that the resurrection took place on a calendar day. And there was, you may recall a few years ago, an article in Christianity Today which said, Dare we follow Boltman? And the idea was, of course, that we don't dare follow Boltman. Well, dare we follow Barth? Well, Christianity today doesn't say that we don't dare to follow Bultmann any more than we follow Barth, whereas Barth's theology is no better than his Bultmann. But, you see, Barth says that he does believe the resurrection, and Barth says he does believe the virgin birth. Now, when you say Barth believes the virgin birth, you say, my friend William Childs Robinson says, then surely he's a lot better then is Brunner, who denies the virgin birth. Well, my dear friends, I do not think so. You believe in the White House, and I don't. But if you say that the White House is a telephone call, then if you believe in it, then it doesn't matter whether you believe in the White House or not. You can't live in a telephone call. Now, in other words, it means precisely nothing more to say that you believe in the virgin birth than to say that you do not believe in the virgin birth. Don't you see? Because the virgin birth is not a biological miracle of the sort that the scriptures speak of by which, through which the Son of God without a human father was born in this world of ours and was man with man for our salvation. Now, therefore, you see, we get no place in evaluating the relative conservatism or orthodoxy of Barth is over against Brunner or against Bultmann. Now, Bultmann does not believe the resurrection as a historical fact, and so we dare not follow Bultmann. And so we turn to Barth's Kierkegaard dogmatic, and we find there that Barth speaks of the resurrection as Taspa, Herba, Fuba. In other words, the body, there is an event, he says, and he has an article uh, separate from his church dogmatic in which he deals with Bultmann, Ein Versuch ihn zu verstehen, an attempt to understand him, he says. They were friends when they were young. They cooperated on this thing. But now, he says, what Bultmann wants is a parthenogenesis of the faith, the virgin birth of the faith. The faith just starts 
of itself without a historical foundation. And we must have factual, historical, factual resurrection as the foundation of the Christian faith. Well, now, you see, that's why Carl Henry and others and my friends at Calvin College and Seminary, Mead, Lewis Mead, the then of the college, and Henry Staub and others, they devoted a whole issue of the Reformed Journal to Carl Barth, all of all of articles in which were absolutely built on the assumption that Karl Barth does believe the resurrection in the same way that we. Well, he does believe it, but he does not believe it in the sense in which we believe it. And that point, I would say, he makes abundantly plain. Because of the fact, as he already said in his first work on Romans, he says there is, to be sure, some event that took place, maybe, in this place, some strange event. But the real resurrection, the real resurrection, takes place in the Shishti, not in his story. And in the fourth volume, which we're now discussing, when he deals with the resurrection, he says we must remember in the first place that it is a, a, a work of God. He says, of course we believe in the resurrection. And we believe in the resurrection as tangible, something that a body that can be touched. Now that seems, you can quote that passage by itself as they have done and say, this is evidence that means that Van Til is dead wrong in saying that Bart doesn't believe the resurrection. Here it is, so many words. I would say, yavol, yavol, leave it wrong, aber. Namely, why don't, why don't you read the whole thing? Why do you not read what he says and makes the point of that the resurrection is the event that of all events lights up, lights up all other events? Now, suppose the resurrection were this event and nothing but that event. Then that event has absolutely no ability to light up other events because that is particularly the event that needs to be lit up. In other words, suppose you have, you turn, you have, I turn out this light. Now then, see we have no lights here. Now somebody comes with an, with a big electric equipment and says, I'll fix you up. But he does, it's short of the sun. He thinks he's got resources of his own, electrical resources of his own. Now, don't you see, he says, the resurrection as an ordinary historical event is like an electric light bulb which itself needs the light of the sun to light up other things. But the resurrection for Bach is just because it is an event, the Christ event as Geschichte is able to light up all other events just because it is not identical with ordinary history. If it were identical, then it could not do what it must do. Now, therefore, if you take the main principles of Karl Barth's theology, which in the first volume we have seen is God is wholly revealed and wholly hidden. Revelation is historical, but history is not revelational. That is, you cannot say of any event, even if that event be the resurrection, that as such it is revelational. In it, revelation is wholly hidden. Now, this is terribly confusing and hard to understand. But you will never understand even an inkling or tittle of it unless you see it in the light of what we have discussed, Kant's philosophy. Namely, here's the I-it dimension and the I-thou dimension. And that that is meant to be a philosophy by which Hume and Leibniz are answered and that you have now saved science, this field of knowledge, but that you have admitted that there is no knowledge of ultimate reality, that that is beyond the conceptual statement of any man, and that God himself can't reveal anything of that realm in this realm in conceptual statements which you can as such accept and identify with the content of revelation. You must always realize that what that God out of that world says to you in this world when he says it is holy heaven as well as holy revealed. Now apply that to the resurrection and you will understand why he speaks of it 
as a separate special history, außer ordentlich Geschichte. Man kommt mit die Historie nicht aus, he says. You can't solve the problem of the resurrection with the concept of history. Now, why doesn't my friend please read that? He says, definitely, it is history, and it is not merely, as Boltman says, that the faith springs out of the church, out of the Christian community, which projected into that Jesus of Nazareth all kinds of attributes which it got from Greek philosophy and what have you. But there is an event which underlies it. Now, Yavol, and then you clap your patties and say, we dare not follow Boltman, aber we dare follow Bart, or at least he is much safer to follow than his Boltman. Now, I'd like to discuss this matter of the resurrection, because this is pretty fundamental. You see, he says the resurrection is an event which you grasp by means of imagination in the same way that the Genesis account, creation. Now, that is not his story either, don't you see? I sprach in the Schlange. Can I so wenig wie jemand anders glauben? I can't believe in a speaking serpent any more than anybody else can. That was not his story in the ordinary sense. That was Geschichte. That's imaginative, and you catch that sort of Geschichte by your imagination. Now, that comes bodily out of Kant's critique, namely the the uh, an Ausbildungskraft, what does Kant call it? It's the imagination by means of which you grasp what cannot be grasped perceptually or conceptually. It's something in the, of a cross between them. Now, that, he says, is how we catch the resurrection. Now, think of the resurrection, he says, as God's work. Now, that's the first thing to remember about the resurrection. I wish my friend Smith would read that. A God's work, number one. If it is God's work, God is wholly other, is he not? Therefore, and he is wholly identical with this world, but when wholly identical, he is yet wholly hidden in it. And that means because it is God's work, it is not identical with any ordinary fact of history. And then he says it is a new work of God. It is a new work. Again, return to the critique of pure reason. And you will see in it that you are told that you must have pure contingency. Now, you see how absolutely nominalistic this is. God turns into the holy other of himself. It is his nature to do so. It is not against his nature that he should become something other. History to be, to have a common history with man, he says. To coexist with man is inherently his nature. Now, it is this point that he is, was nominalist, and that he is nominalist, is what Dr. Berthauer pointed out in his first book on Karl Barth, the title of which is Karl Barth. And he says, Barth is more nominalist than is Occam. And of course he is right, in the sense that Occam at least said that when God comes down, he does, through knowledge of revelation, we can know something about him as he goes along horizontally with us in history. There is a history of redemption. But for Bach, there is no history of redemption in his story. There's always a St. von Oben. For him, revelation is je on je, moment by moment by moment. De novo, and again de novo, and ever de novo. And there is no once for all finished revelation on which we are dependent. We are not dependent on the past, on something that happened 2,000, almost 2,000 years ago. And we living here in Jackson, Mississippi, 1968, as though there were apostles who were given authority by Christ that they should put down once for all the significance, the meaning of what e that event that took place that Sabbath morning, that Sunday morning. That, he says, is not it. 
the disciples at first hand, as Kierkegaard put it, are not nearer to Christ than are we who are disciples at second hand. We are not receiving the gospel mediated through his story. Now, therefore, we must think of it not as telling us what happened in Palestine and what happened in the past in Palestine. Now, there is a sense in which this thing took place in Palestine and it happened in the past, but it is happening now. Now, that is the center of it all, that the Christ event, that his moving from Golgotha to Jerusalem and back and forth, that his step downward, and this I am most anxious to have you see what he means, the step downward, his virgin birth, his death, his burial, then his resurrection and his ascension to glory. They are not steps that follow one another on the calendar. Now he says that in so many words. Why not will my friends read that? They are not steps. Now he says it's a little bit difficult to think of one event, we poor people, who are bound to the calendar and who can't think otherwise than calendrically for us to think of one event which includes all of those. But it's difficult. That's precisely, however, what you must do. You must undergo a Copernican revolution. You must start with the idea of Geschichte, of one event which, of which, which there is past, which there is progression. Christ is foresightless, uber-sightless, not sightless pre-temporal, super-temporal, post-temporal. But those, that progression within Geschichte is not identical with the progression that is here in ordinary history. Now, he is as outspoken on that as you can see. I have a little pamphlet on Bart and Chalcedon, and which I've brought that evidence together. But in, in Christianity and Bartianism, everything I'm saying here is around page three and 400. That is to say, the distinction between the Shikta and his story, and that these steps do not follow one another on the calendar, but that the Christ event envelops that as one event. Now, that means that if that is not making mustard of historic Christianity, I don't know what else is. <coughs> what is there left? Yes. Well, his point is, of course, that this is supposed to be the gospel in modern language. In other words, modern existentialist thinking thinks in this term. That's precisely why we were inadequately, to be sure, we started with Kant, and that we don't know anything about a God up there. Now, since modern philosophy, Kant notably, has taught us this, we must teach the Christian religion in terms of this modern philosophy. Now, he says, of course, that he's not interested and that he's getting away from us philosophy altogether, which is, I would say, obviously not so. He himself was himself said he was using Kierkegaard first. Then he was admitting that he was using existentialist philosophy, and he hasn't changed his category. And while you're about it, People have said that Bart has changed. Well, he has, in this sense. But people have said that Bart changes toward orthodoxy, and that's not the case. Now, you remember that we saw that he went, what he said, nine to nine to Brunner over there, and he went down deep, St. Rechman opened up Erste Gebot, and when Brunner wanted to get off here and said, now we have an under Aufgabe to tell other people, to tell people who aren't Christians. Now Bart is going this way, don't you see, into universalism. All men, Christ and Adam, not Adam and Christ. Christ is the first Adam. He's the only Adam. And the first Adam, as we call him, was of course also a human, ordinary man, but he's a man in Christ, in the real man. The first means the real. It means not the first in time, but it means the first in significance and in reality. Now, that Christ, the only real man, we are all in him. Now, that is 
to all intents and purposes, universalism. And that's like modern medieval realism. This is like modern, I mean medieval nominalism. Here God turns holy into the opposite of himself. Now he turns again in this opposite. And now Brunner gets off over here again. That is to say, Lieber Freund Barton says, and they had separated, and they were not on talking, on ordinary level of talking with one another for years, until a Christian reform minister accomplished the feat of bringing them together again. And I guess he thought he had really accomplished something. Now, uh, so Brunner says at this point, Lieber Freund Barton, you're always going to scream down here to nominalism. And now you're going to universalism. Can't we swing a little bit more moderately? That is to say, if you are going to stress the necessity of faith, you make faith unnecessary. You say people are of necessity in Christ. They can't help but be in Christ. They are in Christ because they are men. And if they're not in Christ, they aren't men. That's perfectly true. Now, and then again, you see how utterly mis- you misunderstand him, both of them, if you don't see that the difference between them is just a difference of the length to which you go, but it is not true, as Reverend Tan at that time in the Calvin Forum said and his others, that Bar- Brunner is more reformed because he believes in common grace and in creation ordinances, and he is so much closer to us reformed people, and as my friend William Charles Robinson says, Bart is so much better than Bruner because Bart believes in the virgin birth, and this horrible fellow Bruner doesn't, and so after. Well, I would say a plague on both your houses. <laughs> that is to say, not, not on William Child. <laughs> I mean on Bart and Bruner, not on their person, not on them personally, but on their teaching which is no nearer to the Reformed faith here, nor is Bart any nearer to the Reformed faith. And that, to me, is the basic difficulty with Dr. Berkhauer's interpretation of the whole story. He said rightly at this early point that Bart is more nominalistic than Occam. And now, in his book, The Triumph of Grace and the Theology of Karl Bart, he again says rightly that there is in Bart really uh, transition from wrath to grace in history is really unthinkable, as it is. Well, if that's unthinkable, it is because there's no need of such transition, because all men are, as Bart says, zum von herein in Christ. I'm afraid there's some German here that might catch me on misspelling. Zum von herein in Christ. Now, don't you see... You have to be both. This is the interesting part of it. If you are one, you are both. Remember the first hour we pointed out that irrationalism and rationalism were born on the same minute at the beginning in paradise when the devil instigated into the heart of Adam and Eve that they must not, that they must submerge God with man in the irrational, in the contingent. And that God is not in a position to dictate and to tell you sum form herein what will happen if you read a, eat of this persimmon. Now, don't you see? That was irrationalism, but it was also rationalism in that man took the side of the devil and said, now I can't stay put here on a neutral basis between these two hypotheses, yours and God, so I'm choosing yours. That means that you must have within you, and I have within myself, the ability, somehow, a priori ability, to see that it'll come out that way, rather than God's way. Now, don't you see, here is pure irrationalism and pure contingency with pure rationalism. This is the rationalism, pure sign, that is, that you soon find herein, put all men in Christ. And that means you don't have as missionaries to go out to the field. Some of your missionaries are coming back to the field. Well, on Bart's basis, that's just as well. Because, you see, you don't have to go out and tell people in the field that they must know what happened in Palestine on a certain date of history and that they must believe that 
for the salvation of their souls, what you must tell people if you go out that they must realize that they are in Christ and that they are potential they ought to realize their potential that is in Christ. Now, that is all involved in this geschichte history business. And that's why the death and the resurrection of Christ are works of God, new works of God. And then he goes back from the resurrection to trace the significance of it and to plant it firmly in his system. He says, look, go back from the resurrection to the life of Jesus. First, from the resurrection to the death of Jesus. That's one event. Well, then go to the life of Jesus. Now, that life of Jesus was not as such a life through which Jesus accomplished anything for the salvation of his people. Jesus, as a Jewish rabbi, was no better, no different than any other Jewish rabbi. But he is nonetheless somehow in his life in indicating that holy other. Now, that's one event. Then the virgin birth. Uh, that didn't take place in, gesch- in his story. That is the Geschichtliche. So that's also one event, don't you see? And then pre-existence. The pre-existent Christ. He says there is no such pre-existence as Christ. That's an orthodox notion. That's a bad word. Namely, when you talk about that, that Christ as the Son of God existed before time was? Well, that it would be back to go to that lake up in the mountains idea, a God separated from us. He wasn't ever thus pre-existent. The pre- notion of pre-existence is all right if you include it in one event. And then you say he's the second person of the Trinity that died in his human nature and that then rose again. Again, you mustn't have a divine and a human nature. That is one event. So you enclose it all. And then you say, God, according to his counsel, sent forth his only son. That's fine if you include it in one event. And then you say, God, by his counsel. That's fine if you include God also in that one event. That's the Christ event, event, the cosmic event, the one event in terms of which all things in life take on meaning. Now, that is what he means. And then he says, you look forward from the resurrection. You look forward. This is looking backward. And then, of course, you look forward from the time that this thing happened in Palestine. Well, you don't mean that this thing happened in the past. We've already seen that this thing is happening now. And therefore, you look Whatever is forward is also included in that event. And then you look forward to eschatology, to the return of Christ. Well, that is not coming on a calendar day. And when Barnhouse went to see him and asked Lieber Freund, Lieber Herr Bart, uh, since he premillennialistic, or the since he amillennialistic, or the eh, what do you call it, postmillennialistic? I don't think he said it in German. <coughs> And I'm not saying it very well in German either. Uh, are you pre or are you ah or are you post? Which would be a matter of high concern for a typical American fundamentalist, wouldn't it? And then apparently Bart gave him satisfaction on that. Don't you see? And when some other American fundamentalists come and see Bart and they say, Do you believe in the resurrection? In, and uh, Yavol and Yavol. And what has that terrible mention pressure said about you? That you don't really believe in the resurrection, don't you see? Yavol, Yavol, Yavol. He believes the resurrection. Well, don't you see? All of which, as far as the future is concerned, does not pertain to ordinary history. And now with it we come to the fifth volume which he didn't write, but which I can tell you what will be in it. <laughs> which sounds awfully cocky, but it isn't quite as cocky as it sounds because he has already himself told us a number of times what's going to be in it. That is to say, all his theology is eschatology. Now, I have brought with me this book by Jürgen Moltmann. 
theology of hope. Now, you may have seen in the reviews, and one, the review and issue of Christianity Today, New Hope for Theology, by the editor himself. One new star twinkling in the murky sky of contemporary theology is Jürgen Moltmann, whose theology of hope, that's this book, supplies a fresh orientation for religious discussion. At Duke University, where Moltmann has served as guest professor, 200 American religious leaders are massing to assess the Tubigan scholar's contribution. Moltmann's view may be viewed in relation to three religious perspectives. One, recent dialectical existential speculation. Second, still broader neo-Kantian Protestant current. Three, biblical theology. Now listen. Constructively, its significance lies in a considerable recovery of the scriptural sense of the future, of future, of the openness of history to the eschatological promises and purposes of God. Moltmann directly confronts Kant's view that nature and history are experienced only as casual, causally uniform realms, excluding any unique divine action. He boldly repudiates the dialectical existential isolation of the human self from the world and history as if divine revelation were to be salvaged only in immediate personal response. And our friend William Childs Robinson, of whom I think very highly, has a little review. Is it in the same edition or somewhere, if anybody can find it? Huh? Yeah, I think so. Find it. Is it on page 17? Or is it in a later edition? If it is, someone take it along this noon. Huh? Well, if you can find that for me, I don't want to waste time on it now. But William Childs' position is very similar to that of Carl Henry. To the effect that, however much you are worried about this book, here at least, take courage, here's somebody that's coming back with a real, much more of an appreciation of history. <clears throat> now, my dear friends, this is where it shows how necessary it is to be more critical than either Carl Henry or Dr. Robinson at this point are. There is not an iota or tittle of evidence in this book. You read it for yourself and see whether I'm right that indicates that he has any iota or tittle of sympathy with a historic Christian position. Now, what does he mean by this constructive thing that he's talking about? Well, I can only bring that out if we return once more to Kant. Now, here's Kant, and here's this causal relationship, this field of science, this I-it dimension, and here's the world of freedom. Now, this is what Croner talks about when he says, look, this is the I thou, the I-it dimension, and this is the hope for the future, because now you can have, and Collingwood, one of the great British historians, says, now Kant has taught us what history means. The historical consciousness is now really really born, because now we don't have to worry about proving how God is the first cause and we are proximate causes. We don't put our problems in this field anymore and get stuck and have to bother with the law of contradiction. We now simply postulate the freedom of man, the absolute autonomy, free man in that world. But now, as Croner puts it, that's an ethical dualism an ethical dualism between the two worlds. It's ethical because it is not conceptual. He does not mean by ethical the question of behavior, how well or how good you behave, how well or how bad you behave. But it means ethical or practical instead of theoretical. This is the world of theoretical thought. This is the world of dogma, of creeds, the creeds of Christendom, of orthodoxy, and what have you. We are now liberated from all that. We're now in that world where we can say, this is science, and science can do what it pleases. We are free. Kant has 
has made religion free, made room for religion. Well, now, Crowley says that dualism, though, you have here an absolute contrast. The freedom of man is set over against, dualistically over against, this world. And now then, he said, and that's what Moltmann argues, he says, they have had very great difficulty. And this is ethical dualism, ethical voluntarism, ethical subjectivism, and finally ethical phenomenalism. That is to say, you first set this two dualistically over against another, and you get a God who is wholly other, as you get a man who himself is wholly other than this world, whose freedom is altogether different from the world of causation, who doesn't know himself, who senses that he is free but has no theoretical knowledge. Now, if you're going to say something about God, then you're saying something about a God of whom you have no knowledge. And then you are, on the basis of Kant's critique of practical reason, you remember on the basis of his critique of theoretical reason, he said you can say nothing about that God, but then he said we have to project a God into that realm and act as if that God exists, and as though he speaks to us, and speak of the incarnation as practical concepts. By practical he means the opposite of theoretical. He means they are ethical, not theoretical. Now, we've had, of course, it is in this ter in terms of this ethical dualism, which you have to overcome by postulating that somehow that other God comes in. And then it's ethical monism again, or ethical phenomenalism. Now, what has been done in recent times, you've seen this book, New Quest for the Historical Jesus, and you may have seen a book by Tannenberg, or... Tannenberg, now, what is his, I don't know that his little pamphlet on history has been translated or not, but Tannenberg is now recently a very popular individual theologian in Germany, and he writes about Geschichte, his story, and he says, and one of the Niebuhrs, the young Niebuhr, has written a uh, critique of historical reason, and he says that Bart and Brunner and Boltmann and the Niebuhr, the other earlier, Reinhold Niebuhr and Nelsbury and the rest of them, notably Barth, have not done justice to history. They were not able to do it, to do justice to it, because, you see, they had this task to perform, to get a God who is wholly other into this world. And the moment he gets into this world, he gets caught in the, in the wheels of necessity, and therefore there is no real history anymore. Now, Pannenberg and all the people that are engaged in what they call the quest for the historical Jesus, or the new quest, the old quest was, of course, the eschatological quest of Schweitzer and others, long, uh, beginning at the 19th, early 1900s. The new quest, and Pannenberg and some others with him have written what they call a programmatic essay, in the which they said, we have to start with the idea of history. And there, we have to, now, they can't explain how you can have history on this basis. Of course they can't. Nobody can. Nobody can explain how history is possible. And we alone as Christians who live by grace of God through the Reformation theology can actually not explain history. We can't see through history. But we have at least something that makes sense out of history, whereas they have only unrelated factuality which they have to relate causally. Now, Moltmann goes beyond Tannenberg, and he says, look, even Tannenberg hasn't shown us what real history is. He hasn't even been able to relate this world of freedom to this world of necessity. The only way you can do that is if you start from eschatology, and if you start from that end. Now, Tannenberg said, we can't understand this unless we start from the end. Now, he was right in that. Therefore, the way Karl Barth says, you can't understand the death and the burial of Jesus and the resurrection unless you start from the top, from Geschichte, from the Christ event. So, Pannenberg said, says we have to start from the end. But he really doesn't start from the end, says, Mo, says, says Jürgen Moltmann. And we have to, therefore, be eschatological with a vengeance. And now, 
Therefore, we have to say there is reality to this thing over here, and we must not deny the significance of that. Now, apparently Henry reads this part of it, and apparently Robinson reads that part and thinks that that is actually some sort of indication that they are ready at least to reconsider the historic philosophy of history. Well, my friend, I don't think there's any evidence for that whatsoever. All the evidence is exactly the opposite, namely to the effect that this is still conscious. Now, Henry himself virtually says that, that he doesn't really outgrow. He says that, you see, in this paragraph that I read, he says that, and Henry is right. He knows his philosophy. But why does Carl Henry, when he goes to Germany and he spends a year off, has a year off, and he sees all these men individually, and he knows all the books they're writing and what's going on, but then he comes to enlighten us. On this point, he comes to confuse us. Basically, he doesn't really enlighten us. You don't need that sort of enlightenment if only you for yourself critically evaluate what's being written, and you understand the modern philosophical approach underlying this, that underlies Paul Tillich and underlies Reinhold Niebuhr, Richard Niebuhr, and the other third Niebuhr, I can't think of his name, and Nels Ferre. Now, Nels Ferre says Paul Tillich's theology is a dangerous theology, as though his own were any less dangerous. <laughs> now, Reinhold Niebuhr, the greatest... Uh, existentialist theologian. They're all brilliant men. We've had a galaxy of outstandingly brilliant, profound, learned theologians. I heard Paul Tillich preach in the Unitarian Church in Germantown in Philadelphia. And he said, we must have a deeper sense of sin than our forefathers had. Sin is demonic. It's beyond what any of us individually can handle. Aber, don't you see? Salvation is also universal, and that salvation includes hope for all men. Now, therefore, you have the negation and the affirmation, and that dialectical swing characterizes all these great modern theologians of the generation past. Now, the younger men, young Robinson, what's his name? William Child's son? James, is it? James, a brilliant man. He's recognized by the German theologians as being a brilliant, original thinker. Now, they knew a number of them have this quest for the new, for the new, new quest for the historical Jesus. What does it mean? They recognize that the historical Jesus has been lost in the preceding thinking. They're looking for him. Where are they looking for him? They are looking for him still in the same, on the same presupposition on which the theologians they are criticizing were looking for him. It is a foregone conclusion that they will never find him in the nature of the case. How can you find what isn't there? Now, you have excluded the Christ of the Scripture by, by your view of philosophy, of reality, if you interpret it according to modern thinking as Kant does. And then while I'm at it, I'll make, end up with Christ the Tiger, which is a sad thing to me, Thomas Howard, son of the editor of the Sunday School Times formerly, now he was brought up as a fundamentalist. This is a brilliantly written book. He's a literateur, his picture's on there, on the outside cover. Now he has been unable to hold on to his fundamentalism. It hems him in, and he has a tremendously detailed description of how you're hemmed in, and you mightn't do this and you mightn't do that, and all of that sort of thing. It's brilliantly written. I never heard of so many things that people mightn't do. <laughs> mightn't do, don't you see? And now he can't, he can't hold that any longer. The facts of science are against it. Don't you see? But now he has made the wonderful discovery. Here we are, all of us, exactly in the same position as though a jet full of passengers were coming down and all were shrieking looking immediately in the face of death. Aren't we all that way? Do any of us, if you look, on the, you're outside of a hospital, and inside they're breathing out their last in great misery. You're just now having a good time. You're dancing around and all of that. Won't be long. You'll be there. Now, he plays on that theme over and over again, making us all in that end. He's right. 
without God, without hope in the world, if it were not dead wrong to say that that's the issue. But don't you see, and this is the point, that the poor boy has never had a chance, if I may use the word chance, to become acquainted with a fully Christian gospel from the beginning. And so he makes a false antithesis between fundamentalism and this neo-orthodoxy. And now he thinks he has discovered in Jesus of Nazareth, somehow, he can't give you a bit of a reason, he complains about fundamentalism, that it could give no reason, that it was against the facts, and he just, in pure irrationalism, attaches himself in what he himself calls the myth of Jesus, which he somehow sees realized in history. Now, don't you see, this is what we're facing. We have lots of good Christian fundamentalist people. They believe the right thing, only they are not critically alert. Now, we don't expect people to be that. But ministers ought to be, and it's their task to be, and it's your business to be. And that's what this seminary is here for, to make you such alert, self-consciously alert ministers of the gospel in terms of the full gospel, the Reformed faith, so that you can help people like this, not criticize them. I'm not criticizing him. I'm just pitying him because he has never been given the opportunity from the beginning. Now I know it can be done. You don't need a lot of learning. Simple, ordinary farmers, I've seen them, I know them personally, do know the Reformed faith, and they know the riches of it and the fullness of it for themselves. My own father was that way. When Dr. Mason died and I was in the dumps about it, he just quoted Hebrews to me, he that believeth in God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He says, in effect, he didn't say any more. He says, you, how little is your faith? Haven't you got more confidence in God that, but that he will see this thing through? That's what God will do with us here at this place if we put our trust in him. Now, we're going to have a class this afternoon. Sounds as though this is the last. <laughs> if it is, if it is, I'll not be sorry. But we'll meet at 3.30 again. And then you ask questions and bring up uh, anything you wish for final discussions.